praise the Most High. Come, all you people, come and praise the Most High. Come, all you people, come and praise the Most High. Come now and worship the Lord. And from the Gospels, Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. here, Jesus was talking in parables that happened to be the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus conveys his message very often, many times, very often in parables where those folks who are listening can relate because he has a way of, of crafting the story and making it meaningful and relevant and understandable to those who are listening. So listen and see what you hear today from this parable. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus said to him, Friend, who sets me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. I guess here on the shore, I would say, I will pull down my house and bigger, build a bigger one on this relatively small lot. <laughs> and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat, drink, and be merry. What usually follows that? <laughs> That's right. But God said to him, as you would have imagined, you fool. This very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, o Christ. Service of our Maker. 
neither does withholding enrich us. Giving does not impoverish us, withholding does not enrich us. So, I think, and I thought, I was reasonably aware of this greed thing, and I, and I pray to God for ongoing awareness, to be convicted by the Holy Spirit when I'm acting greedily, and then to seek forgiveness, knowing that that same Holy Spirit that convicted me will now correct me and comfort me, so I may be more free from greed. And from what I've read in your weekly newsletter, online and in print, and I've seen here from your times of worship and fellowship, which I must say I've thoroughly enjoyed being with you, I'd say you're not only you're not ones who likely hold back. You're quite generous, being the good neighbors to others. Remember the story of the good neighbor and the Samaritan, being the good neighbors to others. Offering some of what you possess to help and heal others, to enrich their lives. But then I read, and I reread the words that Jesus had spoken in Luke, the words we just heard. For us to be on guard against, and here it is, all kinds of greed. Remember, that's what he said, be on guard for all kinds of greed. Not just be on guard for greed, but all kinds. And that really got me wondering and thinking. I thought there was basically only one kind of greed. What other kinds of greed could there be? So I decided to check out the meaning. And I always love doing this, you know. And, and you can do it too in, in a number of places online. You can type in King James Version with Strong's, S-T-R-O-N-G, apostrophe S. And the Strong's, concord, the Strong's gives you a connection to the Greek word or the Hebrew word. So you can actually go and, if you have it, it's fun to try to dig deeply. And I kind of look at it almost like an archaeological thing. That I come up with these amazing discoveries by, by going into the, the Strong's and clicking on the particular word, which sends me right to the, uh, right to the original Greek meaning or the Hebrew meaning and, and what, what, the, uh, what the underlying meaning of the word really is. And that was true here for this word greed. And I discovered it not only meant covetousness, but it also meant a desire for advantage. A desire for advantage. So holding that back then seems to give us some kind of advantage. Well, I guess if you've got more stuff than the neighbor, and if you're living more comfortably than someone else, that sure would be considered an advantage by some. But are there other things beyond creature comforts we hold on to that we think may give us an advantage? Look closely at the words of Jesus and Paul that we just shared. From Jesus. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. And Paul said in his letter to the Colossians, put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, parentheses, which is idolatry. And by the way, the worship of any false god is what's meant as idolatry. But you know what? I don't think it's just intended for some golden calf worship in uh, the book of Exodus, is it? I suspect that we know and see there are many updated versions of the golden calf hanging around us every day. So through these words, here's how I came to discover I'm greedier than I thought. How I'm often desiring the advantage, which in our everyday conversation seems like a good thing to do, right? To have the advantage, does that seem good on the surface? Just like remember, I think the first week I, I shared a sermon with you, I talked about the, the way scripture often has different meanings to words that we use in everyday conversation. I think this might be one of them, where the Bible makes a distinction between the, the, the word meanings and turning it in a way upside down, or perhaps as I said back then, maybe more rightly right side up. Desiring the advantage. It's what I desire to always be in control, to accumulate all the decision-making. To always think I'm right. To think I can do it better and quicker all by myself. <laughs> you know, fortunately, and with growing amounts of fatigue and stress, 
I've begun to share the wealth, this wealth of decision making, to the point of actually letting go of some things, accepting the help of others, whether in church or in business or in family situations. You know, my real estate business, which I think I, I've shared with you besides being here on a Sunday and doing some itinerant preaching, I'm also a commercial real estate agent. And it's only recently that I finally realized, you know, with all the business going on and all the, the multiple transactions occurring simultaneously, there's really no practical way that I could handle it. And all I would do is get people angry at me. They'd call me and go, are you all right? I haven't heard from you in a week or so. And, and, and yeah, I'm fine. I'm just very busy. So I finally made that, that concession. said, you know, I need to get someone to help me, which I did now. And, and it's, it's proving wonderful to, to be able to let go of some of it, to share the wealth, to, to have someone else picking up and, and running with it as well as I. So rather than be the superhuman or the victim, and believe me, I'm in that category a lot too. Oh, I've got so much to do. Why is it all me? Why, why, why? But then, of course, I pride myself to pride. There's another one uh, when, when, I, when I can accomplish what it is, but at times at great cost to me physically or emotionally or family time, you know. So I've invited others to share not only in the challenges, but also to share in the joys and be not so greedy in thinking it's all about me. And I'm also feeling okay about having others taking on some of the responsibility, where before I'd worry others would see me, and this is important for me, and maybe for you too, where by letting go and letting others take on some of the responsibility, where I often worry about others seeing me or seeing myself as weak and as not capable of doing it all. And a lot, and here's, here's kind of the good news, thanks be to God, I'm really feeling freer for letting go. And that's a real advantage. You know, we talk about advantage. That's the kind of advantage I think God is looking to, to, to have us understand that's a true advantage as opposed to the ones we often think are advantages that are not. And that's much better than, than holding on to everything myself. To underscore this point, in a recent conversation with someone, a trusted friend, I spoke of how I would always see myself and want to see myself as the initiator. Can anyone identify with that? That we, we always want to be the one starting whatever it is that we're doing. And how now, and this is, this is a real transformation for me over perhaps the last six to eight months, how now it's okay for me to do some of the receiving, not always be the initiator. And to be sure, I don't think it's an either or situation. No, it's, it's more both and, as we both initiate and receive. And I think that balance is so important creating more of a balance and, and moving away from greed and more toward freed. And that's a big advantage and not a bad advantage at all. And much like holding on to material stuff or holding on to power gives us the sense of advantage, and I'm going to use that in quotations out advantage, which it really isn't. I'm wondering if the same could be said for words, holding on to words rather than conveying them, storing them up and not, giving, not letting them free to God and to other people. And I think that's worth examining a little bit and maybe finding out that all of us in a way are hoarders when it comes to how we express ourselves. Is there an advantage for us to hold back our words, hold back what needs to be said? Because we may not be ready for the response we get from the other person or as it pertains to God in prayer, we may not be ready for the response we get from God. I faced this struggle many times, personally and professionally, where I needed to share words and was reluctant to do so, fearing my words would not be received well. And what a relief when I would call someone about a difficult topic and the phone went to voicemail. <laughs> and I could simply leave a one-way <laughs> message, thanks be to God. <laughs> Those, I now realize, are greedy acts because it's an, an advantage to avoid sharing, especially when it's difficult, when in reality and in the long term it's anything but an advantage, isn't it, as things continue to bubble and boil and accumulate and we avoid speaking the truth in loving and respectful ways. And it's much the same when we pray, I think, in loving God and expressing our love to God. 
And it's often, isn't it, and I know I've, I've said this at times as I've written sermons, as I've preached them, you know, the, the words that I'm sharing, truly God's words spoken through me, you know, that, that oftentimes I think they're as much from my ears to hear as they are from yours. Since God knows already what we're about to say in, in prayer, and perhaps those words we offer would be uncomfortable for us to say, as will what we may hear from God in reply. Once again, being greedy with our words, holding on to them, may give us a short-term advantage in not having to come face-to-face -face with our God and with ourselves through prayer. But then again, unlike with other people, God knows what we're going to say and how God will respond. So where other people, it may not be predictable what the response will be with God, we certainly know what it will be. When we come to, to him, with, especially when we come to him with contrite hearts and seek forgiveness. So even if there's something tough to say, it's how we say it, it's how we approach our God that makes a huge difference. And it's true, God may expose, expose things about us that we're not quite ready to see or to hear. But God always practices unconditional love and opportunities for us to grow and change and be nurtured whether by God, whether by a community such as this, whether in our daily walks. So maybe we see an advantage in holding on to things, playing it safe and not wanting to upset God or anyone else, or for that matter, ourselves. But in the meantime, we're storing up all of that frustration and anger and agitation, and, you know, storing up stuff which, like in the story of the parable, the, the parable, the, the guy thought was fine to do, good to do. Here, here's, sometimes we store up stuff that's, not healthy for us. Really messing up our emotional and our spiritual barns. As we think of building bigger storehouses will be the solution to hide and hoard all of our emotional stuff. I don't think that's an advantage at all, but a disadvantage. It's an unusual form of greed and idolatry. But I think it's greed nevertheless. It's greed that will ultimately devour you and me if it's not let go, so we can again be free at last. When I was in high school, I don't want to tell you how long ago that was. When I was in high school, I recall one of my teachers had posted a saying on, on, on a board, and he urged us to consider this saying. It was written by the Russian philosopher Peter Kropotkin, and it read, the law of the jungle is competition, but the law of civilization is cooperation. Hear it again. The law of the jungle is competition, but the law of civilization is cooperation. You know, it now occurs to me that competition is the means by which greed and advantage are achieved. They're related, you see. And to take advantage of another is, is part of what happens in that process when we compete and we attempt to achieve and outdo whoever else is nearby. We're taking advantage of the situation and, and of likely of another person. By contrast, when we let go, when we cooperate, we display the kindness and civility toward others that we would desire of them. And you know, as I as I read this, I'm I'm reminded of, and I hadn't written. I'm reminded of, of, of someone once shared with me the importance of cooperating with God also. And the person broke the word apart for me, which gave it much more meaning. It was co-operate. And co meaning together with, right? And operate doing something. So in effect, then, when we co-operate with God or when we co-operate with another, it's really partnering in a way. It's teaming up, isn't it? For the ultimate good. So then the goal is is cooperation, not competition. Relaxing that tight grip, we often have to hang on to things desperately, opening up our storehouses and sharing of our abundance rather than building bigger storehouses to stockpile more material stuff, more power and control, or words. It's learning really, in many ways, a new way of living, rooted in love, in selfless and unconditional love. That's that agape love we hear about spoken in scripture. Jesus speaks of it often of this unconditional, no strings attached type of love, of cooperating and together benefiting so that no one is impoverished and all are enriched together. 
You know, this past week I was listening to a podcast in which the speaker was sharing a story about an anthropologist visiting a tribe in Africa and inviting the children of the tribe to play a game. Nearby to where all had gathered, the anthropologist had placed a large basket of fresh fruit and gave the children the opportunity to compete and claim the basket by being the first to run and get it. When he gave the signal to start running, he was amazed to watch the children all join hands and walk together toward the basket. When he asked why, the children responded in their Zulu tongue, Ubuntu. U-B-U-N-T-U, hang on to that word, Ubuntu, which means a person is a person through other people. Or more loosely translated, how can I be happy when the rest are not? Or put in the context of today's parable, it seems Ubuntu could be expressed as how can I build bigger barns to store more and more of my stuff when my neighbors have little or nothing? And to add to this, this past week, my wife Bethany purchased an early Christmas gift for, one of, for our six-year-old granddaughter. A game entitled, <laughs> this is where I laugh because God has a great sense of humor and his time is flawless. A game entitled, Race to the Treasure. <laughs> Proof again, as I say, of God's wonderful timing to offer me this, this, this great prop for this morning's message. <laughs> In the game, and here's the thing that's so cool about it, in, in the game, the, the players join together to get the treasure and prevent the evil ogre from taking advantage of it. And I, I love what it says on the back of the box. I haven't opened it. We can play later if you want. <laughs> it's, it's, the, the beauty of it is it's called a cooperative game. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> a cooperative game. And because there are many of us probably who wouldn't know what that meant, it answers the question, what is a cooperative game? It's a game where everyone plays together, no one is left out, and everyone has fun. In a cooperative game, players work together as a team against the game, not against each other. And it goes on from there, but it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's a beautiful message. I think my granddaughter Addison is going to enjoy the game, and hopefully there's there's a good message there to impart to you as well as to her. Together, getting the treasure, no one acting greedily or independently or selfishly, no one taking advantage of another, except maybe for the owner, and recognizing that when one benefits, all benefit. And you know, as I thought about that, I reminded myself of what Paul says about something very similar in 1 Corinthians 12, where he speaks of us who are members of the church, of the body of Christ, and he says, if one member of the church suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Ubuntu. So how do your actions or my actions impact someone else? Are you storing or sharing your words and your will? Are you thinking you have an advantage by withholding of your time, your talents, your financial gifts, your words spoken to another, truthfully and in love? Your prayers, both what you say to God and what God may be saying to you, calling you to you, challenging you to change? Have you moved from self to unself? Self to unself, to be the neighbor to another, as we heard about a few weeks ago, to be the chip, I'm sorry, the tipped chalice, not the chipped chalice, <laughs> the chip, the tipped chalice, that is this chalice that I think I may have mentioned you, I saw an image where there's a chalice and there's fluid pouring into it and fluid pouring out of it. And I think it's so fitting that that really is how we should see ourselves, to be that tipped chalice that pours forth some of God's love and abundance that you have received from God while also retaining a portion of it for your own spiritual growth. And truly, that's, I think, what the Eucharist is about, too, is we're fed to, in turn, feed others. In short, can you go from barn raising, R-A-I-S-I-N-G, to barn raising, R-A-Z-I-N-G? And where the barn once stood, 
What if we placed a flag there that simply said, Ubuntu, as we together say, Amen. Amen. Amen.